and we're live. Okay, let's. Uh, Cam and I decided that we're bored and we're going to listen to Arif Ahmed, Ahmed, Ahmed <laughs> versus Gary Habermas. This is one of my favorite videos. And uh, Arif, if you ever hear this, you find out about this, uh, contact me. I'd love to have you on my show sometime. Here we go. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for coming. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes? Okay. Um, I do sometimes tend to start speaking quite quickly and quite quietly, um, especially at the points of my argument that are weakest. So if any, of you, <laughs> if any of you notice that, then please shout out, obviously, especially those at the back. Okay, well, I should start by introducing myself and telling you what my views are. I am an atheist, and that means that I don't believe in God. I don't believe in resurrection, either bodily or spiritual. I don't believe in a special providence. I don't believe in a future state, and I don't believe in anything supernatural. Now, when people tell me that they're atheists, they sometimes say something like, I'm a committed atheist, or I'm a devout atheist. Um, and maybe it's just meant as a slightly feeble joke, but I wouldn't myself, I wouldn't describe myself as a committed or a devout atheist. That is to say, I don't regard atheism as a position I hold as a matter of faith, nor do I regard it as one that I particularly want to hold or would be willing to continue to hold if the evidence were actually against it. I would quite like to believe um, in uh, a good God. I'd quite like to believe a number of supernatural claims, and I would particularly like to believe um, that I'll come back to life after my bodily death. The question is not, however, whether it would be a nice thing if it were true. The question is whether it is true. Now, the issue that we're debating tonight concerns bodily resurrection. And what this means, of course, is that Jesus came back from the dead, not just as a spirit, but as an actual physical body. It was, of course, a rather special physical body, because as you will know, it was one that was able to pass through walls, as St. John says. And the way in which I'm going to pursue... I don't think a lot of Christians realize what he just said, or... You, or really stop to think about that. Christians, you believe in a God named Jesus, Trinitarians anyhow, that passed through walls. Why does Arif say that? Because in the Gospel of John, Jesus, you got the disciples in a room eating, and the, it, I think he even says the door was shut, and poof, Jesus is there. To the question, in fact, a way in which I think it's mandatory to pursue the question is simply on the basis of what empirical evidence there is uh, for settling this issue. Is there sufficient evidence for us to believe that Jesus did rise bodily from the dead, or if there is no sufficient empirical evidence, then we should either suspend belief and remain in a state of doubt, or we should positively believe that the event didn't happen. Now, before I go on to give my arguments, um, I'm going to start with a couple of questions that I'd like Professor Habermas to answer, if he'd be so kind, in his presentation. We all know that historians should be objective about their sources. That is to say, a competent historian, certainly one whom you would trust, is somebody who takes an attitude at least of skepticism, or if not of skepticism, then at least possible skepticism, towards the documents that concern him and which he treats as his historical sources. I don't know about you, but I've often had the experience when I read scholarly articles of seeing a mass of citations and lots of footnotes um, and all the other paraphernalia of, of uh, the scholarly world, finding it quite intimidating. And when I first read it, I think, gosh, this person must really know a lot about what he's talking about because he's got 48 footnotes, whereas this other guy has only got 12. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Cam, but don't a lot of people say that Luke was a great historian? And yep, <laughs> does he cite his sources? I mean, besides saying I compiled some things from some people. No, Doug, mentioning sources is only a modern practice. There's no instance of such things in the ancient world. Okay, so I should lower my standards then? Yeah, you should definitely lower your standards. 
A similar thing, of course, can happen in spoken debates. So, for instance, somebody might give a talk in which he cites a large number of scholars. He might say, 85% of scholars believe this, or the majority of scholarly opinion is this, or I've looked at all the scholarly works on this topic, and they all say such and such. Now, in a case like that, obviously, we can't check the claim that's being made. We're not in a position, because we don't have a text in front of us, and even if we did, we wouldn't have the time to check whether the claim that he makes is true. Therefore, we have to take it on trust. And that's why it's so important that a historian needs to be skeptical and objective. If he isn't, there are reasons for doubting what he says, and there are reasons for, for wondering whether we should indeed take on trust what he's asking us to take on trust. Perhaps the most spectacular example of this is a historian whose name most of you will know. Uh, well, I call him a historian. The person I have in mind is David Irving. Many of you will know that he, he wrote a number of works in which he didn't deny, but certainly radically underplayed the extent of the Holocaust. Those works were copiously referenced and full of all the sort of scholarly paraphernalia that I've just mentioned. If I read it, or if you read it, or probably if anybody here read it, you would think, well, maybe he's got a case. He certainly looks like an expert about it. But I'm pleased to say that, of course, what he says was nonsense. Um, and I'm also quite proud to say that it was one of my colleagues in the history department here at Cambridge um, who was partly responsible for exposing the nonsense that it actually was. Now, that's a very dramatic example of a scholar who is not objective about his sources because, of course, this particular person was driven by the rather wicked beliefs that he had um, deliberately to bias and distort the scholarly opinions that he presents. And, of course, lay people will be in no position to check that. So now this, this gives rise to a couple of very simple questions for Gary. I'm sure he'll be able to answer them. And if he does, if he answers them in the way that I expect him to be able to, then, then this stumbling block is one that we can pass over very quickly. This will be good. Well, Go ahead. So, yeah, but I was kidding about the nobody citing sources in the ancient world thing. But I do wonder if this is a little bit underhanded on Arif's part. Why is that? Like, well, because, like, if you think about, like, really the logic of what's going on, he's in some way, like, calling attention to the the type of, you know, over-citation done on the part of fundamentalist scholars, perhaps Habermas included, and not only that, drawing like a parallel between, you know, potentially a, somebody who could argue non-objectively for a historical claim in the same manner in which somebody denied the Holocaust. So, like, it kind of, like, sets up this this thing where he's almost, like, implying that that the case that's going to be argued against him is, like, equivalent of or equivalently bad in terms of like scholarly integrity as arguing for the non-existence of the Holocaust. I can see that. One question is whether he believes the Bible, the original Bible, is inerrant in all respects. If he thinks that everything in the Bible has to be true, I mean, for instance, the seven-day creation, the age of man extending to a thousand years, the parting of the Red Sea, the statement in Mark that people who believe in Jesus will be able to drink poison without harm. If he believes all of those things and he doesn't doubt any of them, then we have to start wondering just how objective a historical scholar he really is. Now, of course, I'm sure that he is an objective historical scholar. I'm sure he does have some skepticism about some of the historical claims in the Bible. And I'd be grateful if he could tell us just one or two of, one or two of those claims over which he has these doubts. That's brilliant what he just did. And this is a, dare I say, tactic that Bart Ehrman uses a lot, where, look, if you're going to call yourself a historian, then um, you should be critical of or doubtful of some things of the text you're reading. And could you please outline that for us? Or do you just accept all of it as true? But in some way, it's a you know, a continuation of laying the trap that if he's unable to do that, he's like a Holocaust denier. <laughs> but continue. I'm sure he'll be able to, and I'm not going to go back to the issue if he does. 
The last thing I'll say on this point is that you might say exactly the same about me. That is to say, you might say, well, look, here's this atheist, isn't he rather arrogant, coming along with all of these claims, um, and he's got his own atheistic worldview, and he's presenting it. How do we know he isn't going to be biased and distort the evidence? Well, the answer is, the arguments that I'm going to present, at least tonight, are ones that you can all check straight away. They're not based on the consensus of historical opinion, of scholarly opinion, and I only cite, at least in the arguments I'm giving now, I only cite a scholarly article once, and that's one you can very easily check. Let's suppose then that uh, Gary's been able to answer the question that I started by asking him. And uh, let's move on now to the question of the evidence for the resurrection. Now, I'm not going to be concerned particularly, at least not at this stage, with minute analysis of the historical data. I'm going to allow quite wide latitude for what historical data we admit. In fact, I'm going to admit quite a lot. I'm going to suppose, though in fact this isn't true, that we have a great deal of contemporary written testimony about the resurrection. I'm going to suppose, though this isn't true, that the testimony was written by people who were entirely unbiased, all of them, who were skeptical and highly educated, um, and I'm, I'm going to assume uh, that we've got no other reasons for doubting what they say, other than the content of what they say. I claim that even then, we don't have a case for the resurrection that is worth a second look. Now, the first argument for this, I'm going to give three arguments for that this claim. That was brilliant, what he just The first did. argument for this claim is the one that's listed as the first argument on your handout. And rather than go through it, I'm going to start by presenting an analogy in order to illustrate it. So let's imagine, uh, in the first case, that you have a pitcher of water, say a bucket of water, and you have a thermometer with which to measure it. Well, better, let's imagine not just that you have one, but that you have four or five thermometers. Oh, I've used this, I've used this before in my own videos, like way back. Um, and I'm, I just want to say for the record, I give credit to you, Arif. <laughs> I think I did at the time, but maybe I didn't. With which to measure its temperature. And you put the thermometers in the bucket of water, and they say that it's 10 degrees C. And you put your hand in, and it feels quite cool, so you think, okay, that's Celsius that's for the Americans. Right. But now imagine that the thermometers say that the temperature was 30 degrees C. Now, you might put your hand in and think that's a bit odd, because it's quite cool, indeed cooler than I normally feel water at that temperature to be. But nevertheless, maybe it's because there's something wrong with, with the way in which I detect heat by touch, and probably all of these thermometers are correct. Let's now suppose that the, thermometers re the thermometer readings are that the water is at a temperature of 600 degrees C, and that the water is still in its liquid state. Now, in that case, I don't think, in spite of the evidence, the independent evidence of all of these thermometers, I don't think you would say, ah, oh, look, we've got water that isn't boiling, that's at 600 degrees C. What you would say is that we need to get a new thermometer. Uh... I think that was an extremely powerful analogy, and I don't see, I can't, I'm trying to put myself back into the days when I was a hardcore Christian and how I would respond to that. You know, you, you could have 100 thermometers in that water, and they're all reading 600 degrees Celsius, but you don't see the water boiling. You still have to say to yourself, do you not that it's more likely that all 600 thermometers are in error or that the laws of physics and chemistry have changed? So can I, I'll comment critically on it. I think it relies on, for the analogy to follow or at least for it to be rhetorically effective, it relies on the fact that there's an absence of other things that you would expect if the water were at 600 degrees. So if we consider the thermometer to be analogous to like a claim about a resurrection, for the analogy to hold, you would have to have a range of similar things um, that are absent that you would expect to have if a resurrection actually did occur. Just in the same way, is there a, are a bunch of things that you would expect to observe if it was 600 degrees that you don't. Right. You'd expect to see bubbling, maybe some yes. wa water vapor. You'd expect to see the pot to maybe be red hot. All these or various... Like 
all these various modal things. <laughs> yeah, and so I think somebody could say, well, the analogy doesn't follow because in the case of the New Testament, um, you know, the story seems to tell the story about other types of things that we would expect to see. You know, the disciples come to believe and, you know, Jesus, like, hangs out with them. <laughs> And he, he flies up the hill. <laughs> after they all finally recognize him. Okay, here we go. The reason that you would say that is, of course, this. We have never observed water, boil it, water not boiling at temperatures significantly above 100 degrees C at sea level. We have frequently observed thermometers going wrong. Therefore, the more likely hypothesis on the basis of the evidence we have is that the thermometer has gone wrong then that the water is at a liquid state, is in a liquid state at 600 degrees centigrade. Now, I hope the point of the analogy is clear, but let me just show how it applies to the argument at hand. We have frequently observed, the first thing I'll say is that we have frequently observed and verified beyond doubt that there are cases where skeptical, highly educated, independent witnesses testify to something that didn't happen. Now, the case I'm going to mention, this is, this is the one scholarly citation that I hope to have to make tonight. The case that I'm going to mention is one in a well-known study by Robert Buckhout in 1974, in which what happened was that he staged an assault on a university professor in California in front of 141 independent student witnesses. So these were highly educated people with no bias. Seven weeks later, not 10 years or five years, or however late it is that our first written testimony of the, uh, of the resurrection is. Seven weeks later, he asked the students to identify the attacker, giving them a, a set of photographs. 60% of the people he asked positively identified the wrong person, including the victim of the attack itself. Now, there aren't, it's not just cases like that. There are dozens of other cases, including rather tragic real-life ones, where people have been convicted on the basis of independent eyewitness testimony. Um, and as it turns out, from later forensic evidence, the conviction was wrong. So we have clear cases where we have much better eyewitness testimony than we could possibly have had for the resurrection, which has turned out to be wrong. Now, moving on to number three, this is the third assumption, premise on the, on the first argument. Something we have never observed, ever, except possibly in the one case under dispute, and we can't assume that now, something we have never observed is either of these two things happening. The first one is that bodies come back to life after three days. We have never observed that. Oh, that's just false. There's uh, thousands of cases in places like Africa and South America. And so I've been told. Um, Kenya. <laughs> like, um, again, I try to put myself in the shoes of the Christian, and I, this is things they would say. We just don't see these things verified in the Western world because it seems like, God doesn't like verification uh, that way. He doesn't like, you know. Oh, no, 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 no. It's because of the lack of belief, Doug. Oh, that too, yeah. Um, and I, going back to his eyewitnesses being bad, I'm trying to put myself in the Christian mindset and what they would say to that. And they would say, but under... Can I guess? Sure, go ahead. No, you, you go, you go. I'll, I'll tell you if it was the same as mine. Well, I'm just thinking back to some of the conversations I've had, and like guys like um, Lydia McGrew, John McClatchy, they would say, um, well, there's, how do they put it? There's multi-sensory type. Uh, it's just not vision. It's they touched him. They heard him. They saw him. Um yeah, well, that isn't what the claims in the New Testament or in Paul say, but that is what the Gospels say. But I think that what Tim McGrew would actually say is something more along the lines of... Duress? Um, yeah, like in cases where, like, the event itself was a life-changing experience. Yeah, there's... That's something that you don't forget and that you that you get the, the details 
pretty much right on whereas like some you know random fight or assault or something that you didn't really care much about and didn't have much impact on your life but 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 like what what he's saying like a guy like uh mcgrew is saying is seeing jesus rise from the dead is like remembering your first kiss you know everybody remembers their first kiss um and if there's some christians single christians watching i'm I'm sure you haven't kissed yet, but um, <laughs> well, if there's some single atheists watching, oh yes, yeah. Um, but the thing is, yeah, we still don't know. There's not one eyewitness in the New Testament who said, "Hi, my name is so and so. I saw the risen Savior." Except for Paul. Right? That's correct. Oh, actually, no, that's not correct. Because I think in 2 Peter... Oh, is that a resurrection claim, though? Maybe that's just a claim of him, the, like a more of a ministry claim. But I- anyway, it's... Uh, Two Peter's considered to be a forged document, so it's not really relevant anyway. But yes, of the authentic like uh, letters attributed to an individual author that we have confidence of who they were, yeah, that's the only claim. So, like, if you're a Christian watching this, really think about that. What I just said, I think, is true. That there is not one case other than Paul where someone says, "Hi, I am." fill in the blank, I'm from fill in the blank, and I saw the risen Jesus. Yeah, and you don't even need to, um, you don't even need to put the high, I'm blah, blah, blah. Um, <laughs> I've like, just been funny, you know. Yeah, but yeah, the point stands. Okay. The second one is that solid bodies pass through solid rock. Certainly solid bodies the size of human beings have never been observed to pass through solid rock. These are things we have never, ever observed. It is therefore reasonable to suppose that it is more likely that in this case, the case of the resurrection, where the witness testimony is worse than in the Buckhat case case I described earlier, it is more likely that the witnesses got it wrong than that the resurrection actually occurred. So if I was to stop him there, I'd be asking him... Um, you know, how have you evaluated that the eyewitness testimony is worse? Is it simply by numbers? Because, you know, Tim McGrew and people like that, they would say, oh, you know, the the, the numbers isn't what is relevant. It's the quality and the quality of the character of the person who's attesting to the event. Yeah, and I have... uh, So so if you're Tim McGrew... Like, beat Tim McGrew for a second. For, uh, in fact, I had this conversation with him, or maybe it was Lydia. Um, I would ask the question, um, so Tim, are, which are better witnesses, dead ones or alive ones? Oh, I don't think that we can make such generalizations with respect to witnesses, Doug. If someone was to testify for you in a murder case, someone accused you of murder, and you had a choice of a dead one who is going to possibly help acquit you or a live one to possibly help acquit you, you would choose, it doesn't matter which one you would choose? Well, I I mean, I think in the case of all evidential reasoning, it's the context that is most relevant. So when we're evaluating the quality of evidence, what we evaluate is the context in which that evidence was given or produced. So I'll give with, I'll give for you an example. Um, George Washington, that's my dead witness. <laughs> Versus your mum. <laughs> I take my mum any time. <laughs> Phrasing, Doug, phrasing. (laughs) Now, the argument is the form of three premises and a conclusion. So one, two, and three are the premises, and four follows from them. If four is false, then one of one, two, and three must be false. So my next question for Gary is which one of those premises, one, two, and three, he denies, and why? (laughs) 
Let me move on now to the second argument. The second argument is based on an assumption. I'll allow a certain assumption. I don't believe it's true, but let just, let's just suppose that it is true. Let's suppose that we've ruled out conclusively all the possible um, naturalistic explanations, that is, ones not involving supernatural intervention, all the possible naturalistic explanations for the evidence that we do have for the resurrection. Now, there are a variety of, a variety of such explanations. There's the theory that Jesus didn't really die when he was taken down from the cross. There's the theory that his body was stolen. There's the theory that there was a mass hallucination. There's the theory that they just all made it up. There are quite a few theories, but let's just suppose that we've conclusively refuted all of them. This will be good. Many people say, for instance, nowadays, many people say that the theory, what's called the swoon theory, that is the theory that he didn't die on the cross, that theory is nonsense because it can be conclusively proved that somebody, or it's, it's incredibly unlikely that somebody who was crucified in the manner that the Romans did it would have survived it. Indeed, there may be only one case. There's one case I think Josephus mentions, but there's no other known case where somebody survives crucifixion. I do find it slightly surprising that the very people who are so insistent that you can't survive cruci that a body can't survive, survive crucifixion then happily go on to say that a body can survive death, but be that as it may, we'll move on to the, the argument. There are many cases where we find a phenomenon which has no known natural explanation, which later turns out to have a perfectly good one. Now, in some cases, that's just because we're ignorant of the facts, and later we discover certain historical facts that we didn't know at the time. In other cases, it's because we've discovered some new physical theory. These two cases aren't particularly... The difference between these two cases doesn't matter for my purposes. Let me give you a couple of examples. Nobody knew how the pyramids were built for a long time, and some people thought that that was evidence for either supernatural intervention or UFOs. Recently, we've discovered roughly how the pyramids were indeed built. Another example is the phenomenon of meteors. So rational and enlightenment person as Thomas Jefferson once said that he would sooner believe that the professors who testified to the existence of meteors, he would sooner believe that they were lying than that stones should fly from the sky. And many other people believe that it was a miraculous or supernatural event. We now know, of course, that there's a perfectly good natural explanation for meteor strikes, and although really noticeable ones are rare, nevertheless, we can understand why they happen. Another example is lightning. Until Benjamin Franklin, many people thought that lightning was, again, some sort of supernatural phenomenon, but now we know it's simply a, a form of electricity. Now, let's think in particular about the case of hallucination. I'm not advocating the hallucination. I, I want to make a, a strategery comment, as George W. Bush would say. Um, you notice what he's doing here? He's purposely pausing after each point. Like, I know it's not very long, but it's like two or three seconds, not two seconds. He's letting these points sink in rather than just rattling them off. He's the pro. Hallucination theory, I'm simply yeah. using it for illustrative purposes. There's plenty of things that we don't know about how the human mind works. Indeed, it's almost certain that the amount that we don't know about how the human brain and the human mind work far outweighs the amount that we do know or that we even have an inkling of. Isn't it therefore reasonable to suppose that, hallucination might be an example, that there is some unknown natural explanation for the evidence that we have for the resurrection, rather than that there is a supernatural one? In all other cases where all known natural explanations have been ruled out, we've discovered that there was a then unknown natural explanation. That is therefore evidence on the basis of experience that this is what's happened in this case. But then the Christian at this point would say, but what is it? What could it be? If you've already ruled out the swoon theory and stolen body theory and all this, um, what could it possibly be? So therefore, it has to be a resurrection. That makes more sense, right? I know, I know, I know. Somebody invented time travel, but that person happened to be really immature. And they went back into the past... And they arrange things, including the New Testament documents, such that it would look like a resurrection occurred, but it really didn't. 
Indeed, many Christians believe that God has made a very complex but very beautiful universe and that it's for us to discover its laws, though they be hidden from us. And somebody might adopt that attitude and indeed take also an attitude of what I think is the appropriate humility and suspend belief about the resurrection because he could say, well, there may be a natural explanation for the evidence, the evidence being the testimony of people like Paul. There may be an explanation for that, but we just don't yet know what it is. It does not follow that the explanation has to be supernatural. I know from pers personal experience that Christians don't like atheists talking about humility. <laughs> Let me move on now to my third argument. I'm now going to suppose the second argument admitted, though I don't think it's true, that all known explanations for the resurrection or for the testimony for the resurrection have been conclusively ruled out. The third argument goes further. Let's suppose that I was wrong, okay? Let's suppose that not only is there no known natural explanation for the evidence that we have, namely the testimony that we have from St. Paul and others, there's no known natural explanation for that, and in fact, let's suppose there's no explanation at all that can be given by science. So let's suppose we've conclu proved conclusively, I don't know how on earth we could do it, but let's suppose that we've proved conclusively that not only science in its present state, but science in any possible future state could not explain the data that we have for postulating Jesus' bodily resurrection. Oh, this, I love this part. Even then, I think we don't have grounds for believing that it took place. Do you know where he's going? My reasoning for this is as follows. If we're allowed in postulating hypotheses that would explain what the disciples say they saw, or what Paul says the disciples say they saw, and if we're, al if we're allowed in explaining that to suspend certain regularities that we've observed, to, we've observed all the time, for instance, the regularity that solid bodies don't pass through rock, if we're allowed to suspend such laws as that, who's to say which ones we can suspend? And who's to say which ones we can't? Let me give you some examples. This is beautiful. It has been said, there is a report in St. Paul that Jesus appeared not only before himself, St. Paul, though that was last of all, but also before the disciples and also before 500 people. Now, you might say that that was a hallucination, and the argument that it wasn't a hallucination is something like this, that 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once. But the reason for thinking 500 people can't all have a hallucination at once is because we've never observed it. So given the evidence that we have, we have to drop, thank you, we have to drop one of two uh, general statements that we've observed. One of them is that bodies don't come back to life and solid objects don't pass through rock. The second one, which we could also drop, is that people don't have collective hallucinations. One of these two is false, Okay, if we're allowed to assume some supernatural explanation, let's suppose one of these two might be false, but who's to say which one we're to drop? Maybe there was a supernatural hallucination. So Jesus didn't really come back bodily from the dead. All of these people merely hallucinated that he did. I'm not saying it's likely, not at all. All I'm saying is that we've got no better reason to doubt that hypothesis than we have to doubt the hypothesis that he actually arose bodily from the dead. Both hypotheses go against everything we've experienced, so if we're willing to drop, you know, beliefs about everything we've experienced, it seems to be either one could be dropped. So you've got no better reason to believe in bodily resurrection. But one of you gives eternal life, so why not choose that one? <laughs> um, Your decisions about what to believe have nothing to do with how likely they are to be true. But... I wanted to make a comment that um, as far as Paul's writings go, there's no indication that the appearances were group appearances. That's an important point. Well, I mean, he does say at the end of, I mean, at the end of the charisma of First Corinthians 15, that um, Jesus appeared to 500 brethren, right? But not at the same time. Does it say at the same time? No, but, you know, let's charitably infer that because... <laughs> <laughs> we want to support our belief, Doug. Okay. 
than in supernatural hallucination. That means I've got one minute left, so I'll just conclude this argument. Exactly the same point apply, could, could apply to one of thousands of supernatural explanations. Maybe Jesus was kidnapped by Satan, who then put something else, somebody else who looked like Jesus in his place, and he was the one who appeared to everyone. That explains the evidence. That's a supernatural explanation. Why is that not to be preferred to the other supernatural explanations we've got? My point is that once you're in the game of dropping statements that we've seen to be confirmed by experience every day, for instance, that solid objects don't pass through rock, you can drop any one that you like. I've got another one. Just in my last... Loki wanted to screw with the people of uh, Palestine just for fun. And so he made it look as if Jesus had resurrected from the dead by giving people visions and mass hallucinations. No, that, He's a trickster, remember? Yeah, but uh, um, Christians don't believe in Loki. So you're better off going with Satan like he did um, and say that, yeah, this is... if if Atheists often get the bad rap that, oh, you're just... You have a presupposition against miracles. But let's bring miracles into it now. If miracles are full game. So why couldn't Satan himself raise Jesus from the dead out of his power? Why couldn't Satan have, you know, d did what he did and... Um, and uh, just made someone sort of look like Jesus. Uh, you, here's another thing that bothered me when I was a Christian, and I don't know if a lot of Christians appreciate this, but on many of the very first appearances reported in the Gospels, he, Jesus was not recognized right away. In fact, in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus gets out of the tomb and he walks on a dirt road with two other followers. And they have a conversation all afternoon. And these two people, these two followers, didn't know they were talking to Jesus. And then they finally recognize him. At the very, yeah, when they were eating at supper after a few beers. It's like <laughs> a, few, or a, few, the a few cups of wine. In my narrative, right. Is that in Luke? Yeah, it's in Luke. Wow getting pretty good with my memory. Here we go. 20 seconds, I'll just say one other thing. It seems to me that in all probability, most Christians who believe in the res resurrection do not believe in it because of the empirical evidence. It seems to me that most of them believe in it through faith. I'm not going to say anything against that view today because as I said at the outset, that's not what I'm going to be, what I'm going to be looking at, nor I believe what Gary is going to be looking at. But if you do believe that, then perhaps if, if that's Professor Havenmasser's opinion, then perhaps he should come out and say it. Thank I, I, I just want to add that uh, I agree with him. I wouldn't use the word faith because it's a trigger word for so many, but um, I don't know how many interviews I've conducted over the last few years, and it's like eventually some amazing experience comes up in the late teens, early 20s. And it's like, Oh my goodness, then what are we talking about all this apologetic stuff when really what got the ball rolling at first and that you still feel so amazed about is this, you saw a demon come out of someone or you saw this thing that could not be a coincidence or you really felt the presence of the Lord on some night back when you were 18. It's like, I really, really think these are the real reasons people believe. And then later on in life, they start to doubt and they come up with these other reasons to, um, to fill in the gaps. Yeah, it's a, a method of reducing doubt or cognitive dissonance to look into things that you find convincing when you're you know, having some doubts, but yeah, you're right. Like I've never met a Christian in my entire life. And I want to meet one, um, that was actually convinced on the basis of the, of the evidence to become a Christian. And it's almost always some kind of experience or some kind of tragedy or like, or indoctrination, indoctrination. Yeah. But for some reason, maybe you can help me with this. Why do I get so much pushback when I say that? 
Uh, maybe because it's true and it's like undermining them. I don't know. Like, I I think I've met a few Christians who will, who will say to me, yeah, Doug, you're right. This is the main reason why I believe I, it was powerful, but that is such the minority t case. It's like most of the time they'll just, they will refuse. They'll, they'll take it as an insult. But yeah, I mean, I don't really care. It might not be effective to bring it up to them, to point it out. But well, it's still true for the majority of Christians. Okay, this is a sincere question to any Christians who watch this live or on a, on the replay. And by the way, I can't see the the, the chat the way I set it up tonight. But um, they're all criticizing you, Doug. <laughs> but my sincere question is that doesn't it doesn't it it at least give you a little bit of pause to hear a guy like me say? kind of like read you like a book before I've even met you. <laughs> I mean, it, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. But more times than not, this is what happens. Even if you're born and raised in it, you have doubts in your teens and then some experiences and then you do a little bit of research and then what do you know? The religion that you were born in was the right one. Um, doesn't it give you at least a little bit of pause that this happens time and time and time again? Like, if this is true, um, saying goodnight to my wife, uh, if this is true, you would think that you wouldn't have this concentrated uh, similarities and experiences uh, at this point in your life when you're the most stressed, you're trying to become an ad adult, your hormones are raging, uh, sleep deprived, usually at that age. Anyhow. Thank you very much. Okay, I thank uh, Dr. Ahmed very much for his speech, and I now call upon Professor Gabby, Gary Habermas to open the case for the proposition. I just want uh, people to know, who, if they're not familiar with Gary Habermas, he's the guy who a lot of uh, Christian apologists um, cite as having this uh, database that the consensus of scholars say this, and the consensus of scholars say that. He is the guy who came up with the minimal facts argument. Um, that's his claim to fame. And so, he, in my opinion, he doesn't... Well, I'm not going to say that. Um, but he, um, he is well-respected uh, in Christian circles for sure. Uh, and I think even um, guys like Price and Carrier would even say that respect him for some things um for being a real historian of some sorts Would, is that fair who price and carrier if if i was if carrier was here and price was here and i asked them what's your thoughts on habermas is he like a totally terrible historian or is he okay <laughs> what would they say <laughs> well i'm pretty like uh, i mean i certainly don't speak for richard carrier but i'm pretty sure he thinks he's a you know, an incompetent apologist okay. whose sole interest in research on the New Testament is to confirm his faith. Okay, I was trying to build a bridge there, but I guess that's burned. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't know. It's just like, yeah, I don't, I don't think he has a high opinion of him. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Ahmed, and for all who are involved in uh, staging this uh, dialogue or debate tonight. I appreciate the opportunity to be here. Let me um, first say a few things that I'm not saying, which will sort of uh, provide some parameters for my case tonight, then I will respond briefly to uh, Dr. Ahmed's uh, questions. And then lastly, I will try to at least begin a case for the resurrection of Jesus. Some things I'm not saying tonight. Number one, I'm not saying faith alone or faith at all determines what facts I believe in. 
I want to discuss data. Um, in fact, I will say, if the evidence is not true, I'm willing to walk away from it. it I'm not going to say faith's going to keep drawing me back. I'm not going to argue tonight that the Bible tells me so. I will not argue that the Bible is inspired. I will not argue that the Bible is reliable. Nothing I say depends on the Bible being either uh, inspired or reliable. Dr. Ahmed asked me, am I willing to say that certain things that are apparently taught in Scripture are mistaken or something to that effect? And sure, I have questions about all sorts of things. Seven-day creation, Genesis, I think that's one of the examples he gave. Yes, I have issues with that. If it turns out not to be true, I don't ha that's not even my position. So I, I don't have any problems with that whatsoever. Uh, there's a universal flood by Noah. I mean, I, I, we can pick different things. But not only do I not have a problem or am I willing to admit issues, because I am, but secondly, nothing I say tonight will depend on inspiration or reliability. In other words, I'm going to make a case based on the vast majority of critical scholars and the vast majority of critical, very critical scholars, which I would define as skeptics, agnostics, or atheists. Thirdly, I will not argue that something is true because scholars say it's true. More about this in a moment. Yes, he made some comments about long end notes and long, and I, I do that a lot. I have some very long end notes with a lot of sources. But I don't think something's true just because scholars say so. As a matter of fact, if, here's, here's my general point. If this is a predominant view, among scholars, conservative, moderate, and liberal, and even atheist, then probably there are some reasons why they share this view. So I will talk, talk both about scholarly consensus and real reasons for that consensus. Fourthly, I do not say, although I will start with scholarly consensus, I don't say everybody agrees with my conclusions, obviously. I am not going to argue tonight. I suppose we could be pushed there or moved there in the discussion period or maybe in the Q&A, but I, it's not part of my argument to argue that the resurrection is a miracle tonight, at least not by David Hume, Hume's definition. I'm going to argue that a man named Jesus of Nazareth died and that a man named Jesus of Nazareth appeared bodily. I'm not ask, answering or addressing the cause or did God reach down in history or did Satan reach down in history or uh, any of those possibilities. So I'm just asking, was Jesus seen bodily after he was raised? And I think that's consistent with the uh, proposition. I'll come back and say a little bit more about my method in a moment. Now, Dr. Ahmed has... Before we go, uh, go on, he gave all those caveats there. Uh, do you have any thoughts on those? Not really. <laughs> I have a few, uh, or at least one thought on that. And that is like, like if he was here, if he was in this live stream right now, I would ask him, okay, these are the things you're not going to argue for. But I need to ask you this. Do you believe there was a literal Adam and Eve? I'm not asking if you know this. I'm asking you, do you believe this? Do you believe that there was a flood even... Um, that there was animals going into some type of ark. Do you believe this? And then the final question I would ask him is, do you say that you love Jesus? And I'm sure Christians would rip me to shreds and say, that's not a fair question. But I think it is. I think it's a very fair question for him um, when it comes to biases. Do you think that's unfair? Um, I think it's rhetorically good. But <laughs> I, I would rather point out that, like, the way in which he's about to argue most likely resembles somebody saying, well, most scholars agree that there was a yellow brick road. And most scholars agree that Dorothy's house was found at the beginning of this yellow brick road. And most scholars agree that there was a, a, a woods which this path winded through. <laughs> so, <laughs> therefore, there's an emerald city. <laughs> well, that's just silly, Cam. Um, 
Well, but I'm glad you said that because that doesn't make my questions look so stupid now. <laughs> <laughs> no, uh, yeah, your your questions are not stupid. Mine are, but it's just like I'm I'm struggling to take this stuff seriously anymore. Yeah, because uh, Cam and I both know where this is going. This is the minimal facts thing, which um, Mike Winger brought up for proof of the resurrection. And Cam and I are going to destroy this in uh, the next 30 minutes or 20 minutes or 10 minutes. Three arguments on his sheet. And I'd like to address the first two. We can separate these two out. But I would like to make some general sorts of conclusions about... Uh, we could take this from a number of different viewpoints. David Hume's critical work, his essay on miracles, what scholars today call antecedent probability. But I would just make a few conclusions up front. What is possible or impossible in history depends a lot on one's presuppositions. For example, we're not discussing tonight, and, and ought not, but I mean we're not discussing tonight whether there's a God in the universe. But I am making the point that whether or not there is a God has a tremendous bearing on whether or not resurrections. If some of his first two cases in particular are... The, the silly thing about this is that it's such a red herring because n never at any point did RF say that um, resurrections were impossible. So talking about whether or not God exists and you know whether or not people think that resurrections are impossible or possible is completely irrelevant because Arif hasn't asserted that they're impossible. He didn't use that as part of his arguments in any manner. Yeah, uh, so my advice, Christians, if you find yourself uh, saying, oh, you just have a presupposition against miracles, ask yourself, why are you making that comment? Like, is it because you want the non-believer to be biased against what you believe? Like, do you have a strong desire for that to be the case, and that's the reason why they just don't see things the way you see them? Maybe all three arguments say something like, it doesn't seem to me like resurrections can happen like this. I would say, all right, let's just say there are no natural resurrections in this world. But if there's a God for just, I'm, I'm just talking here about probabilities, not trying to address theism. But to answer his question, let's just say for a moment there's a God, something like the original God. Just even... Just five minutes ago, or a few minutes ago, didn't he say that he wasn't going to argue about God supernaturally raising Jesus from the dead? Didn't he exactly say that he was only going to argue that Jesus was dead yeah. and that he was seen alive bodily? Yeah, he did. So I think what he's doing now is he's saying, I'm going to argue this way, but I'm just going to throw this in so it's sort of fermenting in the back of your brain that maybe this is really what's going on here. Uh, is this presupposition against miracles and a presupposition against a God. But I would just say to Habermas, like, uh, you know, we should be open to the idea that there's 10 gods that could have raised Jesus, you know, one of them, of the 10 or we should be open to the idea that Satan, Satan himself raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Why? Who knows? Um, I could actually have a theory on why Satan could do it. But um, so, you know, if you're going to the if you're going to the God hypothesis that if God desired to do it, he could easily have done it. Well, so could multiple gods or multiple demons or maybe even super powerful aliens, who knows? Maybe God has this like big panel of buttons around him <laughs> and they have everybody on earth's name on them. And he's waiting to the general resurrection where he just like runs his hands across them. <laughs> but accidentally he like butt dialed Jesus <laughs> in the first century in Palestine. <laughs> Oh. <laughs> on a let's say for example basis now let's say there's a there is a god with roughly traditional attributes for god to raise somebody from the dead would perhaps arguably 
make no more, take more, no more work than to say, rise, or appear, in the case of creation. I mean, that's possible. If your point is, we don't see these things happen in the natural world, maybe they don't come from the natural world. Now, I'm not arguing that today. I'm just addressing one of his conclusions. He says at the very end, third argument, what about the possibility of an hallucination? His last, very last statement of the sheet. Therefore, a supernatural resurrection is no more likely than a supernatural hallucination. Well, first of all, if he's going to assume he's not saying this, but if he wants to allow a supernatural hallucination, if he wants to say Satan produces, we're talking about a realm that I suppose he's going to be a little bit uneasy with if he's an atheist and there's no supernatural world. But if all this is is something like this, let's say the, the, the objection goes this way. Um, what do you think about 500 people seeing Jesus, to use his example? What do you think about 500 people seeing Jesus? So this to me shows that Habermas didn't actually understand Ahmed's argument because he wasn't actually using that as a means to explain it in the sense that he was actually thinking that's a good explanation or that it's plausible. What he was pointing out is that it's, a, it's equivalently good to the explanation being opposed in the theist's case. And that's, that's why it's an argument. It's not an argument because he's trying to say that that conclusion is a better conclusion. He's trying to say it's, it equivalently, equivalently explains the data, yet doesn't make any more um, assumption that goes against our background evidence than what the theist's claim does. And he made the point that uh, uh, Arif would be uneasy with, with introducing a Satan uh, causing mass halluc hallucinations, but I would think Habermas would be more uncomfortable with that than uh, the Christian believer would be more uncomfortable with the power of Satan than an atheist would be. Sure, but like I just said, it's completely irrelevant yeah. because it's, a, it, it's an argument, um, it's a philosophical argument to demonstrate how the reasoning is invalid. Um, yeah. You say, well, I don't think that could be a, a, a miracle, which, again, I'm not going into miracle, but you could say, well, I don't think that happens today. You could say, well, on, on his behalf, you could say, well, you know what? Miracles don't ha uh, happen either. Resurrections don't happen either. Why not a one-time group hallucination? Okay, that's thoughtful. It really is, and it, he's not the first to propose it. But let's just say a solution, something like this. Group hallucinations are not possible, but it's more likely than a resurrection appearance. Okay, if you're... I, sorry for stopping so soon, but the scriptures don't even say that there was a group hallucination. I mean, a group uh, appearance. It's not clear from the text. It, it, when you read Paul's, Paul's talking about, and he appeared to the 12, that could have been one at a time through visions or hallucinations, and he appeared to 500. That could have been one or two at a time over the course of 40 days. The text itself does not claim that Jesus appeared to a whole bunch of people at once. Now, the Gospels get there with like the disciples, like, 10 or 11 of them at one time. But even guys like Habermas are smart enough not to argue the resurrection using the Gospels because of all the problems with it. Right. But once again, and I point out, he apparently doesn't understand the argument that was presented. To use that, in the earliest sources, we have more than one group appearance to Jesus. So if we're just going to post that, out there for discussion, what such are they? as the 500 witnesses. No single group hallucination will solve the issue. We have several groups, even in the earliest list in 1 Corinthians 15. Does not say they appear to 500 at once. So what you end up with is something like this. If you want to use a natural event, like a group hallucination, to explain the resurrection, you have to do something like group hallucination one not the only one in history, you have to have group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination, group hallucination. Now I want to know which is more likely. Group hallucination, one-time event, which the only one happens here, we need four of them, or resurrection appearance. I'm just saying, things How like that upset the apple four? cart. Up 
I don't know. Like, didn't he say that there were three group hallu- hallucinations before, and now there's suddenly four? <laughs> I, maybe he said three or four. But again, I no, don't... No, I don't know. Maybe I missed it. But I don't even know which ones he's talking about, because that... But we he have... doesn't even reference it. Like, he doesn't even say where in the text it says that. Yeah. He certainly doesn't say it in 1 Corinthians 15 that there was more than one group hallucination hallucination in that account. Yeah, so it sounds like to me he is referring to the Gospels. Set the balance of probability. Oh, actually, actually I, I need to correct myself. No, it does. I just, I just actually remembered. It depends on how you interpret it, but it says, um, like, Peter James... Or something like that, and then the twelve. Remember, it says that, and then it says, and then to five hundred, and then to me, last of all, or whatever. However, it goes. So there's two there. If you interpret the five hundred bit as a group hallucination, but again, like I said, let's say Peter had a vision, James had a vision, hallucination. And then... Although, actually, one thing that I will say. We need to be mindful of, of the fact that Ahmed, at the beginning of his opening, uh, conceded all of the territory and all of the ground. In fact, he conceded the ground so far that he said that he would be um, happy to entertain the case that we had, you know, written testimony from multiple of these people. Yeah. Yeah, good point. So basically everything Habermas is saying right now is uh, a reef is already conceded in this debate. I mentioned one earlier. If there's a God, it could be as easy as rise. If we're going to say group hallucinations, you could say, how many of them do you need? And how many of them are likely? There's some other issues with this sort of compounding of three arguments of uh, Professor Ahmed's. For example, we often hear well, you need really good evidence, and not all evidence is good. And here's some problems with eyewitness evidence. It is still true in historiography, almost non-existent in ancient historiography, but it's still true that we need early eyewitness data whenever possible. Our law courts in this country, across the ocean, U.S., we're based on that. Could somebody be lying? Yes. Could eyewitness testimony be wrong? Yes. Can we produce examples why eyewitness or early testimony are wrong? Yes. If it's that bad, why do we use it? And why is it considered empirical, at least in an historical sense? It's good data generally considered, and sometimes, often, it's the best data we have. So when you get to the New Testament, for example, it would be interesting if we had early eyewitness data. But good evidence does not mean, you have to have good evidence, does not mean, I need good evidence, I need good evidence, I need good evidence, and then you say, you know what? I don't think any evidence would convince me. Just like the question he asked me about the Bible, I would ask him, how much evidence would it take you to believe a resurrection if, for example, there were to be a God? And I want to emphasize this. This is not about theism tonight. I'm just saying it changes the probability structure considerably. In fact, a philosopher by the name of Owen, who champions this sort of approach, the antecedent probability, he says at the end of his article, if one puts God into the process, it totally upsets the apple cart. He said, I, I accept that. So it actually doesn't as significantly as they might imagine, because it turns out that even if there is a God, in fact, even if that God is Yahweh, it's still the case that Yahweh doesn't desire to raise almost all the people on earth. In fact, like incredibly infrequently does it, if at all. So it's not it's not as if like conceding that a God exists means that the prior probability is much higher. It's still the case that apparently God operates in such a way that he typically doesn't raise people from the dead. Although it, it seems like in the Gospels, um, as Hitchens says, is a banality back then. It was pedestrian to raise people from the dead. It happened all the time. <laughs> Critique, even though he's taken this response. Here's another one. George Mavrotis, and I'm still just referring to his uh, three arguments. George Mavrotis, in a critique of... Uh, David Hume and his argument, and arguments like it, in the International Journal for Philosophy or Religion, 
Mavrona says the problem with these sorts of arguments goes something like this. David Hume says all of evidence is against the miracle. And, and Mavrona says, well, what would that look like? In, if you have a small group and no evidence means you and your buddies at the pub or something like that, well, you might have a case where nobody's reporting miracles. But that kind of, a, that kind of an evidential eyewitness sort of uh, summary is not going to be enough to say survey says or all the evidence says or this is a representative sample. But says Mavrotis, the minute you start extending your sample, the minute you start saying, well, let's try to get a, a representative enough m number to do some statistics here, you will have some miracle reports. Now, he might say, well, yeah, but let's dig in and check those things up. And I agree with him. I agree with him. Let's get in there and check them up. But some of these things, I think, and I don't think, I, again, not arguing miracles. I'm going to argue another class here in a moment. I think some of these are going to make the grade. A non-miraculous event that points to something beyond this world that I think violates his own beliefs that he said at the beginning. For example, if you say, well, and I think his, his three objections go in this direction. If you say, well, all, all things being considered, I'm going to choose something from the natural world. All things being considered, I'm not going to go with a resurrection appearance. Fine. How about something like near-death experiences? I, for example, I have here, just happen to have this. I wanted to read it on the plane, and I didn't get it done. But here are several articles of the famous Oxford philosopher, A.J. Ayer, who one year before he dies has two near-death experiences. He's an atheist. He says, I think these really happened. He said, I presented veridical evidence for this. And you know, I'm, open, I'm more open to the afterlife. And I know a fellow who knew A.J. Ayer right before his death. He said he was really open to afterlife just before he died. Now, I've been studying near-death experiences for 30 years, and I'm going to say very, very briefly, there's some highly, highly evidential cases, not nice lights, nice travel, highly evidential cases. Professor Ahmed said, you know, it'd be nice to believe that I'll be raised later. Well, there are some cases that are so evidential, this doesn't make them prude. I got something to say. <laughs> Uh, mine's short. I mean, at Go this ahead. point, all I really feel like saying, oh, that's a really interesting claim. How about you demonstrate it? Like, that's the claim. Where's the evidence? It's like, it's, claims are cheap. We can make claims about anything. We can make claims about Bigfoot. Um, okay, um, so if you're a Christian listening to this and you've done some reading on near-death experiences, which are not dying and coming back to life. But let's say you actually even done some reading on people who've actually died for a few hours and come back to life. Um, or a few minutes, whatever. And you've read some amazing things about people seeing heaven. And maybe even you've read things about people seeing hell. Here's my question to you. How many things have you read about people seeing nothing? Nothing. No heaven, no hell, nothing. Where people have had a near-death experience or actually have died, and they see nothing. If you're going, now listen to me carefully, if you're going to take what Habermas is saying as evidence, then you have to, I think, take the fact that some people see, most people, let me underline that, most people see nothing. How do you explain that? Do you just... Take the evidence you want to have so desperately because you want to believe this and throw the other stuff to the curb. Yeah, it's a bit of a selection bias, isn't it? Was that too harsh? It doesn't force them, but they've been written up and from 10 to 20 different peer-reviewed medical journals have covered these cases. Largely public, we, we know the survey says kind of responses. We don't read the evidential ones. I'd be glad to discuss them. Well, why is this relevant? Because it upsets the evidential apple cart. It upsets the probabilistic apple cart of three philosophical arguments like these. Four, as I said, if there's a God, there could be a miracle, a resurrection like this. Not my argument about the miracle, but it could happen. Here's another one. If near-death experience is obtained, if there's evidence for afterlife, what's a resurrection? Specific case of afterlife. Wow. If we already have in one survey in America, 
8 million people who've experienced near-death phenomena. I'm only interested in the highly evidential ones. I've collected over 100 cases. I'd love to talk about some of these if any of you have a question. But just all I feel like he's saying here is like, oh, if I could convince you, if I could make an argument that convinced you that an afterlife was true, then Jesus rising from the dead would be more plausible. <laughs> it's like, well, okay, like, but we're in a debate, buddy. <laughs> like, don't you have to demonstrate that an afterlife is real <laughs> in order for this to be relevant? Like, it's it just seems so silly. Well, <clears throat> You're going to be proud of me, Cam, and I, I, I'm just, I just exist for your love. Uh, but I, I uh, help my daughter with grade 8 math, and they do probabilities. And I told her this little neat trick. Uh, the word am, A-M, you know, it spells a short word, am. But it stands for, when you see the word and in probabilities, that's a little hint. You should multiply the probabilities. And if it's or, then you add them. And so um, what Habermas is saying is a little bit like grade eight math. He's saying... Only for independent events, but carry on. Yes. <laughs> what Habermas is saying is so, sort of... Is sort, more. Is, he's, he's, he's using grade eight math here in a way, but he doesn't realize that he's actually making his case look worse. Because what he's saying is... And he's not saying this directly, but let's say he's saying, well, maybe there's a God, maybe there's not. Let's say it's 50-50. But now he's adding in that this God has desires. And he desires to raise Jesus from the dead. And let's say that's even 99% probable. You notice what happens when you take 99% times 50%? You get a number below 50%. It's become more improbable. Well, yeah, and if it's the case that in order for his argument to follow, you have to um, take into account your credence with respect to near-death experiences, then if your credence for near-death experiences is 50%, and that's all his argument gets you to, if his argument is dependent on it, all of a sudden you're down to, you know, 49% divided by two. <laughs> it's like, or, you know, times by half. So it seems to me like what I'm when I'm hearing Habermas speaks in my head, there's a graph and it's it's like the probability of the resurrection is dropping as he speaks. <laughs> it's like he's adding layers onto it. Yeah, well, especially like, you know, it wouldn't be the case that you were adding layers onto it if it like. So if, for example, he said, you know, this evidence is or this like claim is not a dependency in my argument it's just like supplemental like my core argument doesn't depend on it but here's another consideration but from what it seems at the moment the only mechanism he's using to bypass um amidst um usage of prior or appeal to prior probability is you know this effort to raise the prior but you can't raise the prior unless you actually use demonstrated pieces of information that increase it right so it's it's just silly it's i'm i'm in agreement with you like i think he's adding on additional details that are actually harming his case at the moment here's my point if certain afterlife cases i'm going to say well are you a little bit more open to resurrection now does that open it up a little bit so these sorts of considerations uh, move the evidence. And I would say if you heard... Well, see, that what he just did there is a little bit dishonest because it has nothing to do with whether or not we're open to the resurrection. I'm a Bayesian. Um, Ahmed is a Bayesian. Like, we are open to every hypothesis that isn't contradictory. You know, while we admit that some of them have vanishingly low probabilities, we're still open to them. So it's not a question of openness. It's a question of prior probability. And it's been argued on the defense that the prior probability is low. So you can't say that he's not open to it. He is. He's considering the explanation. So to put that on him, I think, is just a dishonest tactic. It's like a means to poison the well. It's like, oh, my interlocutor is not really open to the hypothesis, and that's why. And all I need to do is to sort of try to make something, um, you know, 
put forward a case that makes him more open to this explanation. It's, yeah, it's bullshit. But I totally understand why he's saying that. Um, oh, you forgot to whisper. Shit. Uh, <laughs> um, I understand why Habermas is saying this. If he's sort of conservative-ish background, because he's, the default situation is if you're not a Christian, you're not open to it because you've been blinded. You don't have the Holy Spirit in you. But I, I kind of think that's bubbling underneath the surface. Heard some good evidence or case, you might say, hmm, now I'm really open, a little bit more open to what happened to Jesus. Okay, just some things to put on the table to answer his questions. His, four, his first lead question, then his three cases, four total. Uh, let me say some things about the resurrection of Jesus. And um, I've only got a few minutes, so I'm going to make this real fast. Good. I'm going to talk about what the majority of scholars say. They frequently do not even address the issue of whether the resurrection is a miracle, just of the data itself. Ooh. Is, does, the, excuse me, has the man Jesus died on the cross, and was he seen later, and if so, in what form? We could talk about different natural theories. Dr. Ackman is right. We could discuss one if you want. Today, you will find almost no scholarly dissension on the fact that Jesus died due to crucifixion. John Dominic Cross, and co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, a skeptic, does not believe in the resurrection. Uh, Marcus Borg, co-founder of the Jesus Seminar, both say that Jesus' death by crucifixion is as well attested as any event in the ancient world. Well, if they say that, although I, I, I really like John Dominic Cross, and, um, but if they say that, then they're stupid. <laughs> <laughs> and they need to hop outside of their New Testament bubble because <laughs> we, we have far better attested things than that in the ancient world. Okay. Now, what's he seen afterwards? What's this based on? Many Christians will sort of punt to the Gospels. I think we can do that, but I'm not going to go there. Tonight, I'm going to take a why. more unanimously contested case by contemporary critics, and it goes something like this. The case is that... The Apostle Paul is the earliest witness we have. Michael Martin, an American atheist philosopher who wrote a case against Christianity, says, the only eyewitness we have for a resurrection is Paul himself. Now, I think we have more than that, but I'm saying that's how respectfully Paul's testimony is taken. I don't know anybody who will dispute the claim in any of the following sentences. I shouldn't say anybody. Oh, a challenge. The vast majority of critical scholarship, a New Testament scholarship, and I'm in the 95 100 range here, and I've counted. We can talk more about that later if you want. Yeah. Here's some statements. The earliest disciples had experiences, real experiences, that they thought were appearances of the risen Jesus. Conceded. I just published an article, tw two of them, peer reviewed journals, not conservative journals, saying this is granted by almost everybody. Pub I'm curious, how many, <laughs> how, many, how many scholars actually believe there was 12 disciples? How many, what was the percentage? I wish we could rewind. What was the percentage he just said? 90 to, I think he said, 95. at one point he said unanimous with respect to Paul, and then he said 95 with respect to that claim that he just made about seeing. The, the, the problem with this is that the degree of difference in, oh, sorry, the disagreement about what those experiences are likely to be or what information we have about what those experiences were like, you know, that's wide and it, you know, varies considerably um, among the scholarly community. So for example, you have Gary Habermas who has the attitude that the experiences the disciples had is effectively what is depicted in the Gospels. You know, some physical appearance where they're seeing a Jesus up close and personal, perhaps even touching the body or, you know, eating with Jesus as is um, claimed in, I think, John. You know, and then there are, there, then there are folks like Bart Ehrman who more take a perspective that, we don't really know exactly what the contents of their experiences were, but we at least know that they came to believe that Jesus was resurrected. It, you know, it's a very, very different claim. Um, and generally, I think scholars like Bart Ehrman don't think that they actually saw a physical body that they could touch and 
feel. Um, they think it's, you know, something more like bereavement visions, um, you know, which are common across all of human society. Um, yeah. I have a question for you. How many uh, months or years passed by from Jesus's purported ascension to the Paul's experience? Do we know? Jesus's ascension to Paul's experience. Uh, is, it, is it three is it three years or something? Okay, so let's say it's two or three years, whatever. Jesus. Oh, oh is it actually that? Soon? I'm trying to think about it. No, I actually don't know. To be honest, I don't know. But it's a it's a lengthy amount of time, right? Yeah. Okay, so Jesus goes literally into the clouds. From there, I suppose, heaven, which is up somewhere. Heaven's a place, not on earth. Um, and then Paul sees Jesus in a vision or in flesh and blood. If it's flesh and blood, my question is, did Jesus' beard grow while he was gone that two years? Did he smell like he hadn't bathed in a while because he wasn't on earth? Did he switch out of his earthly body, go into a new body, and then come back into his earthly body just to see Paul? Is the second coming of Christ really going to be the third coming of Christ because the second was really when he saw Paul? Like These are things I don't think Christians think about, but when you really stop to think about it, it's just... Yep. Yeah. I mean, I think that this is the weakest part of, well, one of the weaker parts is um, the misleading appeal to scholarly consensus. Um, I mean, truth is not decided by a, a nose count, but I think it's an incorrect characterization of the field to say that most people believe that uh, the disciples had experiences with the bodily Jesus. Published. I'm, I'm just saying it meant peer review. Second, Paul had an experience that he believed to be appearances of risen Jesus. Yes. James, the brother of Jesus, widely believed to be a skeptic of his own brother had an experience that he believed to be the appearance of the risen Jesus. Two skeptics in this group now, Paul and James. When do we date these? And I remind you in terms of historiography, we're looking for early eyewitnesses. The disciples may or may not, on my case so far, have written some gospels. But those gospels are only 40 to... Whoa, whoa, whoa. I want Christians to hear what he just said. May or may not... Hammermas is admitting that Matthew and John may not be written by Matthew and John. He's just admitted that just now. I, I actually don't think that he was doing that. Um, if, you, if you listen closely, he was saying, according to the case that I've made so far. May not, on my case so far. Listen. Yeah, witnesses. The disciples may or may not, on my case so far, have written some gospels. But those gospels are only 40 to 60 years after. Do you see what I mean? Yeah. Like he's, he's trying to say, like, you know, according to the argument I've presented, they may or may not have. It's kind of like, to me, what it sounded like there, his, his mind went in the direction of wanting to use the gospels. And then he realized, oh, no, I haven't made a case for that yet. So I have to, like, assert, you know, agnosticism about it. The cross, and some people are going to say, that's far too far to make a difference in history. I'd say study ancient history. The earliest biography we have of Alexander is about 400 years after his death. Our main accounts were yeah, Julius Caesar. But study, study ancient history. What other miracle claim do you believe in on the basis of ancient history? And how many miracle, miracle claims do you know there to be? See, that, that's, that's the problem, is that the only miracle claims that Christians generally believe in are ones that come from the Bible.
but there's like many many miracle claims from ancient history about all sorts of god and gods interacting with people on earth and doing miraculous miraculous things so it's it's a bit of a bit of a silly standard it's like classicists for example just don't even take seriously the miracle claims and the contents of classical greek writings they just leave it to one side because they understand that the type of evidence that are presented in these textual uh, sources are not sufficient uh, sufficient to establish the claims but you know christians want to believe what christians want to believe these are, are about a century and a half after his death the gospels at 40 to 60 are looking pretty good you might say well yeah but that's religious propaganda please ask a question during the q a we'd be glad to talk to you back to paul Paul writes 1 Corinthians 15, conservative, liberal, virtually no difference, 55 AD. It's only 20 years after the cross. Most critics, I'm going to give you their conclusion, I'm going to cut right to this. Most critics believe that Paul received this material. I'm not, this is not my fault. From the apostles and eyewitnesses, Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. Peter denies his Lord, James is an unbeliever. Almost all New Testament scholars believe until he meets the risen Jesus, he meets them, they discuss the gospel, and Paul learns what they're believing. Of course, Paul was a recipient of an appearance much earlier. Paul learns what they're believing. I thought, correct me if I'm wrong here, Cam, but I thought Paul, everything he knew about Jesus and the, and, uh, the gospel was through revelation alone. <laughs> Yeah, he, he swears, I think it's in Galatians, that, you know, he learned the gospel through a revelation of Jesus Christ and not through human, um, you know, through humans. So what Cam and I said is true. Now let's rewind the tape. Meets the risen Jesus. He meets them. They discuss the gospel. And Paul learns what they're believing. Of course, Paul was a recipient. Paul learns what they're believing by discussing it with them. That's not what Paul says in Galatians. You got some splaining to do, Habermas. Bit of an appearance much earlier. Now, this is only five years after the event. Now, he might say, well, look, five years is not two weeks, and two weeks even, you know, we even have a lot of errors after two weeks for early eyewitnesses. We do. But there's a reason it's the best evidence we produce today, generally, in courts of law. It's empirical evidence by, by the secondary historical standard. All right, that is so such Paul, a ridiculous claim. Can you re rewind that back? Produced today, generally, in courts of law. Can you uh, back a bit further? Say, well, look, five years is not two weeks, and two weeks even, you know, we even have a lot of errors after two weeks for early eyewitnesses. We do. But there's a reason it's the best evidence we produce today, generally, in courts of law. It's empirical what? evidence by, by... Did he just say that eyewitness testimony is the best evidence we produce today, generally, in courts of law? He couldn't have said that. That's what it sounded like he said. Even, you know, we even have a lot of errors after two weeks for early eyewitnesses. We do. But there's a reason it's the best evidence we produce today, generally, in courts of law. Generally. Yeah, that's... That's, uh... that's the most ridiculous claim. It's almost like he's, he's living before cameras existed, or, like, or video existed, or like before we discovered DNA, or like... <laughs> or like before we discovered like before we invented cell phones <laughs> uh, well i don't know how old he is maybe he doesn't own a tv and but <laughs> it's empirical evidence by by the secondary historical standard all right so paul gets this at plus five from them but if paul if paul received this material just five years after the cross they had it before he did But Paul says he didn't receive this material five years after the cross. 
<laughs> Rachel made certainly... a good point. This was back in 2008. <laughs> when do critics state this? Critics believe that this material comes from 30 AD, or, or whatever, whatever year you want to pick for the death of Jesus. It comes from that year. How do you know this? This is surely very conservative, right? No. First of all, the material is formalized into a, into a creed. It takes a while to pass things on like that. Garrett Ludeman, an atheist New Testament scholar, says the latest this formalization of the data could be is three years after the cross. The Jesus Seminar in America, who reject, who reject 80 to 90 percent of the red letter words of Jesus in those translations of the Bible with, with the red letters, they say it's two years after the cross. And okay. Um... He's talking about the creed uh, passed on and how close it is to the cross. Um, I'm trying to think of an analogy. The Mormons came, let's say the Mormons came up with a creed. Maybe they did. I don't know. I wish Troy was here. Uh, that six months after the plates were found, they had a creed of, of uh, Joseph Smith finding these plates. And, and it was formalized in some, you know, three sentence stanza or something of what happened and what they found. So <laughs> these are beliefs. Creeds are beliefs. They're not facts. And just recently, three major British scholars, Larry Hurtado, Edinburgh University, Richard Bauckham, he was here today and he lives in Cambridge, but showed up today for a lecture at, at uh, Tyndale House. He's a great example, just retired from St. Andrews University. James D.G. Dunn, as influential as anybody in recent historical Jesus scholarship. And these three put the report at 30 A.D. Now, you can say whatever you want to about comparing this to 2008, but I'm going to tell you something. This makes a grade that is unbelievable in the ancient world. There's nothing like it. In fact, German, liberal German historian Hans von Kampenhausen said, 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, meets all the prerequisites that we, could that we could possibly have of an ancient text. Now, that's way back in the 60s he made that comment. But just recently, a book published by your own Cambridge University Press, What Can We Know About Jesus, by Howard Clark Key, an American theologian who, the only time I've met him, he was arguing for the agnostic position in the New Testament. This is an agnostic position. He begins his book by saying the data for the resurrection of Jesus in 1 Corinthians 9, 1 and 1 Corinthians 15, 3 and following, where a list of Jesus' appearances is produced, Howard Clark Key begins his book by saying this could be tested in a normal court of law. He said, so good is this evidence that we could put it on trial today and get a positive verdict. Cambridge University Press, what can we know about Jesus? Doug. So, I think that there's something subtle here that's been missed. All of the evidence that he's relying on, at least like other than these little tiny references that he keeps on drawing from Acts or the Gospels without mentioning the fact, all of it is coming from 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15 is not in any manner whatsoever eyewitness testimony from multiple people. It's a claim by a single author about other people. And it's even in the form of a kerygma representing something more like a early creedal belief. It's not as if we have Peter writing it or James writing it or the 12 writing it or the you know further 500 it's one person claiming it if that is the form of evidence that you were using to support the your substantial case for the resurrection how about just the possibility that one person lied in human history or was mistaken or was mistaken I mean, I'm not advancing that as the most probable explanation, but do you realize what kind of bind you're tying yourself into by limiting the form of evidence you're relying on to such a flimsy case? It's absurd. It's like, okay, possibly somebody edited it. Like, do you realize that you just made your belief in the resurrection entirely dependent on the case that this didn't get edited by a 
a first century, uh, you know, like a late first century uh, Pauline redactor. Do you realize how flimsy that is? It's so bad. And I don't know if I'm making this clear, but it's like. Uh, here, I can make it clear. If there's a Christian named Sally listening right now, I, I'm sensing a Sally. Yes, definitely. A, there's a Sally watching right now. And Sally loves Jesus, and she believes in the resurrection of Jesus. I want Sally to repeat after me. I, Sally, acknowledge that there's only one person who identified him or herself and wrote it down that they saw Jesus in all the New Testament. I, Sally, affirm this, that everything I believe is based on one guy admitting who he was, saying that he saw something. And that's what I rest my eternal salvation on that and that great rock music band that I saw back in the late 80s and I felt the Holy Spirit <laughs> in me. <laughs> yeah, it's it's pretty ridiculous because you are trying to substantiate an incredibly improbable claim, something that we've never had the kind of, you know, demonstrated evidence for. You know, in any other case in history, it, it's an incredibly rare thing that almost never happens and perhaps happened w once. And you're relying on a single author who you don't even know for sure definitely wrote it. There are some New Testament scholars that do actually argue that all of the Pauline epistles are not um, written originally by Paul and that they all date from the second century. There are other scholars who argue that parts of first Corinthians 15 are actually interpolated. Like, don't you think that if your eternal salvation rides on this minimal case that Habermas is presenting, you should go and investigate those scholars like a ferocious, curious person. I just want to say, I just, I'm, finally engaging in the through my phone and the chat and so forth we've got 42 people watching at this hour um and i just want to encourage you guys don't go to bed because there's a chance i might not leave this <laughs> up uh, on my channel oh that's so nasty for me to say that <laughs> that this might be like one and done but anyhow let's go on because <laughs> uh because Cam and I are a little frisky tonight, so I might. <laughs> yeah, there's a quality bar to this channel, <laughs> and right now it's it's very much live stream quality. <laughs> it's it's Cam drinking beer and is annoyed with Christians quality. <laughs> uh... I'll bring this to a close. I don't think that the three arguments on this sheet are going to help us throughout the resurrection. Now, now, what will they help us to do? These philosophical con concerns of Dr. Ahmed's are good. They are, because they help us caution evidence. But they cannot rule evidence out. And, they, and different things change evidence. If there's a God, the whole system changes. If near-death experience is obtained, the whole system changes. I'm saying we have here good data arrived at by no, scholars who do not believe in a resurrection. If they say the data are good, and by the way, the trend today is for bodily resurrection. So I'd submit to you empirically that what we have is actually, a case. You need to. That is definitely not true because it actually it turns out that since 2008, each time. Gary Habermas has uh, adjusted his numbers of the measurement of the scholarly consensus. So you heard that 95% figure earlier. Each time he's adjusted that, it's actually gone down, such that in the latest uh, published research, it's actually 70 to 75%. Oh, this is good. So, so it, it's, and, and that's actually pr almost certainly nothing to do with the field actually shifting. It's just that his, uh, you know, original claims were wrong. Like, you know, because it, they, maybe they weren't representative. Maybe when he did his survey, he first investigated, uh, you know, scholars who were pro-Christianity. <laughs> um, Habermas, yeah. if, Habermas, if you are watching, wherever you may be, um, 
you're free to come on sometime and talk to Cam and I. Uh, we'd love yeah, to and tell tell us about how that ninety five percent changed into seventy to seventy five percent. Because the the problem is with your methodology is that you've never once published a list of all of the research papers and books you've surveyed, and you've never once published a list of all of the scholars that are included in that survey, and you haven't published your methodology or your method of statistical analysis. You haven't published really anything that allows, and not only that, you, well, I mean, you have published s some details about your studies, but even further to that, you've included in your um, survey of authors people who are not even e experts on the period in question and aren't even trained as historians, as an example, Richard Swinburne. So it's... <laughs> It's maddening. That says, if we're open, and, we're pos and events like this are possible, if, tr if life after death obtains, then we have to be open to ancient accounts that scholars put this kind of credit in that we can test it in a court of law. You know what's so bad about the court of law analogy? What? Is that it's actually not that uncommon for people to be wrongly convicted. Happens all the time. Move into a period like, of... It's, it's maddening, like you're two. saying that like, um, the equivalent of your belief is something that is actually kind of frequently wrong. <laughs> like, like, so not like not more frequently than not, but at least like moderately. <laughs> Okay, um, this is the good part. This is where they do the back and forth. It's off. Um, feel it. free. Thank you. Perhaps I could start then. Um, there were a number of, thing, number of things in your talk that I wanted to pick up on. Perhaps very briefly we could start with the first point because it would be very helpful. You said that you didn't have an issue with various events such as the seven-day creation, the parting of the Red Sea and so on. Could you just please confirm, it would be very simple, you could do it in two seconds, that this you think dirty. those things either didn't happen or it is doubtful that they happened? Yes. You were trying to say, yeah, yes, that's fine. They yes. didn't happen. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Or I'm doubtful. Yes. Well, okay. Thank you. Perhaps I okay. <clears throat> Christians, I want you to hear what just happened. The guy you champion as the guy who gives you all this consensus data has says that he doubts that what the Bible says happened in history actually happened. I can move on now to the next, uh, the next point, which is one that you, you brought up a number of times, which was that if eyewitness testimony is so bad as that, why do we use it in courts of law? Yeah, and I don't mean it's so bad. I just mean, can we find exceptions? Of course we can find exceptions. But does that invalidate eyewitness testimony? Not for a second. It doesn't invalidate eyewitness testimony. The point is not that eyewitness testimony is really bad or invalidated. The point is that given the evidence we have, Eyewitness testimony get it, getting it wrong is more likely than solid bodies passing through rock. Oh, okay, okay. So you're saying, uh, let, let me make sure I understand this. You're oh, okay. I have to rewind that. That's that, that's the one. That's the that's a great way to f to frame it because, like, what is more known and repeatable and like in our background knowledge. <laughs> Okay. People rising from the dead or people being mistaken this, or being credulous or being superstitious. Watch Gary Habermas's face. I know it's not a clear picture, but watch his face. This is the nail in the tomb <laughs> for the Christian. I mean, it's really bad or invalidated. The point is that given the evidence we have, Eyewitness testimony get it, getting it wrong is more likely than solid bodies passing through rock. Oh, okay, okay. So you're saying, uh, let, let me make sure I understand this. You're saying we have more chance to accept an eyewitness, what, someone says it passes through rock, and you say chances are you're wrong? Yes. Okay. Now, then this is not on God's existence, but would you allow that if, if there's a God, that can happen. If there's near-death experiences, there could be an afterlife. Any of this sort of thing changes data. For example, I, I don't want this to go anywhere. So I, I, I hate to pause it, but I just have to repeat that he doesn't understand the argument. 
if he did okay and that's me being charitable me saying that he doesn't understand it is being charitable because the other option is that he does understand it but is deliberately misrepresenting it in order to be able to you know not look as bad yeah there's no way he's misunderstanding the argument but maybe he is though because i've talked with some really high profile apologists who don't seem to get this stuff so i don't know maybe they maybe it's their job not to get it but where but the answer i, I can't we're not going to theistic debate but but to answer your question would you say if god existed god could potentially take a body through rock is that possible if a traditional theistic God existed, is that possible? On theism? It's not a question of what's possible or not, it's a question of what's likely or not. Of course, it's logically possible in any case whether or not God exists that solid bodies should pass through rock. No contradiction is involved in it. But if God created the, the world, ta taking a body through rock doesn't really if, seem like an issue, does it? If God doesn't exist, it's supremely unlikely. If God does exist and can do whatever he likes, I've got no way of judging what's more likely than what. Fair, but if that God. I actually think that that's kind of wrong because I think that we can judge the probability. It's it's not inscrutable as people like uh, Mike Lacona would try to claim because we actually have empirical evidence about the way that um, this being behaves in the world. So, for example, in the case of Doug... I have an like I have a lot of experience with Doug as a person Careful. and Doug <laughs> Doug typically doesn't swear out loud um you know in str in like strings of profanity like in fact it's so rare that I don't think I've ever seen him do it now of course he can do it you know I'm not denying that but it's just not typical that he does it and I know that about Doug. So, like, it, it, yes, it's true that Doug can string, like, sentences, you know, entirely full of words should that I, I don't should like I try to say it? on a live stream. Should I try it right now? Well, yeah, you can, and I can get you to do it. But the point here is, is that we all know that it's possible Doug can do it. Well, actually, sometimes Doug has a lot of trouble with this because of his upbringing but um <laughs> but but we all know it's possible but that's not the question it's it's about what's typical doug typically doesn't do this unlike some other people that i know who actually do this quite often and so when it comes to god we actually do know what god typically does now he might have a particular motivation such as doug being in this live stream being pressured to swear he might have a motivation to raise jesus or you know miraculously make him walk through walls but it's typically not the case that he so has what you're such saying motivation. Is, so what you're saying is even if there is a god we know through our experiences that he doesn't typically raise people from the dead or do miracles like walking through walls uh having people walk through walls and so forth so therefore just like i typically don't swear i can swear and god could do these things it's just not typical that's right and so it's it's not we don't have to rely on um possibility or impossibility we're still able to talk about what are, are generally observed things uh things that have been observed like at least once or things that have been observed once in relation to many many times that it's not observed and that still is relevant it's yeah anyway i, I do think it's more likely god raised jesus from the dead than me swearing a long s sentence of swear words right now <laughs> <laughs> wow that's a bold claim i just can't do it <laughs> and if i were to do it right now then i'd have to definitely put this offline after we're done <laughs> if that god judges evidence if that god also says i want to test someone if we can argue from the principles of scripture that i witness testimony is good Early testimony is good. If God says things that indicate 
let's just say, that certain scientific laws obtain, that there even are laws of nature. In other words, if God is an evidence-granting God, an evidence, uh, a God who recognizes evidence and who sets disciples up, who, m many authors in the New Testament say, I've checked these guys out, I've checked it data out. It feels like he's just a little bit lost here. And I will, I, I must point out, and I'm sure people have noticed this, but do remember what he said in his opening statement, that he wasn't going to rely on appealing to God, but instead was going to establish simply the case that Jesus was crucified and that Jesus was seen alive. Without recourse to an explanation of a god and a miracle, he said that. But he needs this to bail him out here. If God is such who tells us, hey, he gives us these senses, he tells us to go after this data, it certainly changes things if there's a god. What, what do you say about the near death experiences? If there's. Ah, uh, this is what I call whack a mole. An afterlife, would you be more open? Or the question I ask you. What would it take for you to say, wow, resurrection is looking better and better right here? Okay, there's three questions there. The first question, as far as I understand it, seems to be, would I believe that solid bodies could pass through rock if God told me that they did? And the answer is no. Um, the second... No, no, I, I'm asking about near death. If, like something, I'm saying, what would have to obtain for you to say, I'm really open to a resurrection? I'm saying, for example, if there were some highly evidential near-death experiences, and if we talked and talked and talked and we... You came over and we watched a rugby, rugby match together. At the end of the match, you're going, yeah, you know, this is pretty interesting about near-death experiences. I've never heard any evidence like this. I'm saying, would you then be more open to a resurrection? Okay, good. Um, I think there's two points I'd like to make about near-death experiences. The first point, for those of you who don't know, what Gary's referring to by near-death experiences is cases where somebody, for instance, is being operated upon or somebody has an accident and their brain stops and their heart stops and then afterwards they report, for instance, having been out of their body or they report having seen lights and, and, and other sorts of uh, phenomena that we normally associate with consciousness. Now, there's two things I'd like to say about that. The first thing is that even if there were near-death experiences, that seems to me entirely irrelevant to the question of bodily resurrection. That's like confusing the, uh, confusing the statement that if a ship is wrecked, then the sailor survives, with the statement that if the ship is wrecked, then the ship survives. Even if, there's bodily, uh, even if there are near-death experiences, it has no bearing whatever on the reanimation of a corpse after three days, let alone on the question of whether solid bodies can pass through rock. The second thing I'd like to say, and I was hoping not to have to cite any other scholarly authorities, but it seems that I do. In summer 2007, the one journal... Um, uh, which is peer-reviewed and which covers this issue, which is the journal Near-Death Near Studies, um, published an article which said, no compelling evidence that near-death experiences can ex obtain uh, information from remote locations during their experiences has been forthcoming. Who, who's, the, who's the article? By uh, Professor Augustine. Okay, what he's not telling you is Keith Augustine is the executive director of philosophy. He's the executive director of Internet Infidels. He and I debated last year. A 60-minute head-to-head debate. He, now, this is good because he specializes in near-death experiences, so obviously he should be able to blow Habermas's evidence away right off the bat. But I'm not talking about a person who comes close to death and sees lights, as you said. I'm talking about a proud... Sorry to pick on you. Right here in the room. <laughs> And we know that after a person has a real heart attack, they are heart dead and brain dead. Brain goes dead in 11 to 20 seconds, empirically. You're out, obviously the debate's over, the guys rush in, they're working on you, and thankfully they get you, you're, you're going to live, you're going to be okay. <laughs> and one hour from now, you're fine. But you say, hey, you know what? I was kind of up here above my body, and there's this really strange thing on the roof of this building, it can't be seen from anywhere. I saw an accident out here in the street. Red car hits a yellow car, and we heard some sirens out there. We don't know what's going on. Make a long story short, let's say there's a police report on campus. These two cars hit, but we know you're brain dead when you report that, and you give it when you come back here. Now, that's what Mr. Augustine and I were arguing about, and he knows the cases, right? So he and I, he, went, he did a three-part article. Okay, what's the argument against this? What I've heard is um, that oftentimes with these near-death experiences, the way they find out this information after the fact is through psychologists who sit them down and talk to them what happened. And we don't know what 
subconscious cues this psychologist has given? What if in this example, for example, uh, that, the, that the psychologist had this information of this accident? I call BS on all of it, but um, it, even if it were true, how do you know that this information wasn't obtained after the person was awake, alive? Um, yeah, and what I will say is that I personally have investigated a number of miracle claims that Christians have made after they've claimed it and then subsequently it's turned to just sort of like vanish in my hands because you know the people who um claimed it originally no longer agree with it or you know that more information came to light that oh. dismissed it or it was uninvestigatable on jonathan and on jonathan mcclatchy's page uh, a christian challenged both me and cam to call a doctor who reported this miracle um and i didn't do anything but cam did and i didn't he didn't tell me he was going to do this so cam actually emailed the guy the doctor and asked them specific questions and the doctor admitted that well at the time we thought the diagnosis was this it really looked like that but turns out it probably wasn't or something to, to that effect the doctor basically yeah that's right yeah and this is this is the thing is that like bringing this kind of stuff up in the debate when it's uninvestigatable it just doesn't stand as evidence it's just a claim and the right rhetorical move to make is just say okay gary that's the claim like where's the evidence like it's great for you to just claim something you know, we, we can say that, uh, you know, Daniel was a prophetic text written, you know, 400 years before the events it describes and accurately predicts those events down to a T. That's a claim. Now, where's the evidence that substantiates it? Yeah. That's, that's the problem. Hold there. A lot of data. He and I argued about a bunch of cases written up in medical journals and... Um, Let's just say, I, I don't want to look at me or look at this or look at that. He conceded the debate after it was over. So, so I mean, I'm just saying, don't say. I'm just saying, I won. I kicked his butt. Like, this is all irrelevant. It's like Arif hammered him on a point. What is more likely, the more likely question? And Habermas was flabbergasted. <laughs> and, and he's now like, immediately shifted to NDEs and and stories that we can't verify and debates that happened in the past and and he admitted to me he conceded it's like it's it reeks of I'm I'm losing it here and I gotta bring it back somehow <laughs> to me it's like somebody on the schoolyard claiming that they want to fight or something like that it's so silly <laughs> here's the sentence as if this solves the issue and say well see he he concluded this also what you're not saying is and in that issue there were there were several responses from other scholars who asked, answered him and said this is not a good response and and some of the top near-death researchers yeah, I don't mean to go off over there, and you're right, it's not bodily resurrection. You're right, that's a good point. But here's my point. If there is an afterlife, if there's an afterlife, you've got to be more open to a specific case, no matter what kind of a specific case it is. Okay, there's two things I'd like to say about that. The first thing is that at best, what we, well, three things actually. The first thing is that, of course, in debates, debates are not always the best way to get at the truth, though I'm sure this one is. Um, <laughs> In debates, who wins is often down not only to who has the best case, but the, you know, the person who's the most forthright and the person who's, uh, you know, who's strongest on the day. It isn't always the best way to settle it. So you can't say because he's won the debate, therefore he's right. The second thing I would say is that at best, in this case, we have a case of what Hume called proof against proof. That is, we have one scholar saying one thing and another scholar saying another. In an issue as under-researched as near-death experiences are, and they most certainly are, and concerning an organ of the body, the brain, about which we know less than any other organ of the body, it seems unwise at this point to come to any definite conclusions. 
Um, and the final thing I'd, uh, I'd like to say is that, of course, the existence of near-death experiences, even if it were, even if they did exist, seems to me to have no bearing whatever and would not make me any more open at all to the statement that solid bodies pass through rock. Uh, uh, okay, and, and NDEs would not make... Uh, I feel like um, uh, Ahmed got the real short end of the stick during that particular exchange, not like as in that he came off looking worse, but... Habermas talked for a long time. I know that we talked a lot too, but, <laughs> but like it seemed like he got a chance to like make multiple claims and throw out more and more and more claims, whereas Ahmed just asked him pretty much a simple question. But it's the shotgun strategy. This is sh the shotgun debate strategy where when you're against the wall, you just go ch -ch and you just pellet with a whole bunch of different things and uh, expect your opponent to uh, address all of them. Make you any more open to resurrection. No more. And, and, and I agree with you. Winning or losing a debate, there's no way there's a... In fact, we talked about this this afternoon. There's no one-to-one -one relationship between winning a debate and truth. That's absolutely 100% true. But now you've made the comment two or three times that, that just because somebody... Uh, you know, just because somebody can talk about flat brain, flat heart. Therefore, that's all we know about heart. No, but you know what, I, I think that's, that's a, that shows a little bit of moving away from the data. If you say, okay, well look, all our machines show the heart's not working. All the machines... I, I think I, we gotta stop it here because this debate's supposed to be about the resurrection, a Bali resurrection, and they've now spent 10, 15 minutes on NDEs, like, well, yeah, and I think that it just demonstrates the point that you made earlier. He's bringing up a case that apparently to him feels essential in order for him to, you know, make his resurrection case because he's spending so much time on it. Yet, like, it's clearly controversial. It's clearly uncertain. And so if you take it from the position of, like, evaluating probabilities, if his case has this as a necessary component, yet this is so uncertain and has to be resolved in its own little mini 20 minute debate, then like how more uncertain is the resurrection claim? How's this? Oh, this is, uh, yeah. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say this before I even say it. This is gonna be good. <laughs> um, if you're a believer, if you're a Christian and you say that every human has a soul, and that soul doesn't die. It either goes to heaven or hell or somewhere else. And if there's just one case, just one, where someone dies and comes back to life and reports nothing, you should reject the God hypothesis and Jesus rise from the dead immediately. If there's just one of those being true. <laughs> And so I'll, I'll take Doug's argument and frame it in a pro probabilistic manner. Isn't it unexpected to you on your belief in a soul that survives your death that upon a death of a person, they would subsequently, when they come back to life, report no experience? Isn't that unexpected? And from what I've studied, and I admit I've studied very little about NDEs, but that's the majority of the case, that people experience nothing. Well, how should we end this, Cam? I want to thank everybody who stayed this long. How many people did we end it? It was a long time. I, I think our record is like three hours. How long have we been going? I'm on? sorry that we didn't get to the end, but um, um, not sorry in the sense that I felt like watching any more of them. <laughs> We've got 36 people watching. Kudos to you people for it's probably in the middle of the night for you guys, unless you're on the West Coast. But that was fun, actually. I enjoyed that. Um, I don't know how different Habermas is today compared to 2008. But at some point, like, is there a Christian watching right now and saying, 
man, that Harif guy made a little more sense than Habermas. Or maybe those two goofballs on the screen here <laughs> made more sense than Habermas. I don't know. Yeah, well, especially considering that he conceded so much ground right at the beginning. Yeah. But, you know, that's partly how I left Christianity is um, I remember being, this is so bizarre that I still, I vividly remember 10, 15 years ago, like when the Atheist Experience, that, t that YouTube show, was just starting out like 15 years ago or so. I remember sitting and watching that as a Christian, a diehard, fundamentalist, conservative Christian guy, and saying, my goodness, these atheists make more sense than the Christians. And I wonder how many times that actually happens where Christians watch debates like this and say the same thing. Or am I just so different that I was open to being infiltrated by those evildoers? I don't know. It's James White, I think, Gorda. But yeah, I it might just be your um, constitution there, Doug. But uh, I mean, I certainly hope that in these debates, <laughs> people have a bit of a seed of doubt. Hmm, they kind of made a little bit of sense. <laughs> oh, people watching, don't leave yet. I got an announcement, an important one. Um, tomorrow, I think at tomorrow at noon Pacific. I'm interviewing a former pastor who's gay, uh, who went through, um, what do you call that? Uh, gay conversion, gay conversion therapy. therapy, gay deconversion therapy, gay conversion therapy, out of gay into hetero. It will be really interesting. I really honestly don't know much about this guy. So I'm going to like get, get the full story background. His name is uh, Tim someone. Oh, I forget his name. Sorry, Tim, if you <laughs> happen to be listening. <laughs> I'll tell you what his name is because I, I want to do it justice. Um, his name is uh, Tim Rimel. Yeah, he's an author. Um, he sounds like a, a great guy to talk to. So it'll be a great interview. And I'm just, I want to know, like, what, how do Christians actually try to get gays to become heteros? Um, I want to know, like, do they do chants or do they spin, <laughs> spin in circles a few times? And say, oh, do they use know. blood magic? That's the question I want to, I want to answer. Do these men lay hands on each other? <laughs> Okay, this is a serious topic. These people get psychologically abused by weird cults that, yeah, anyway. Okay, thanks guys for hanging out with us. That was fun. We'll see you, see you tomorrow at noon. Good night all. Or good morning. <laughs>